I'm Caleb Chapman with the Jazz Education Network, here with another installment of Beyond the Notes. And uh, today I'm talking to my longtime friend, the legendary Mr. Kirk Whalem. Kirk, thanks so much for Man, taking time to chat. My pleasure. My pleasure. You mean there's something beyond the notes? <laughs> well, we're going to find out what that is right now, <laughs> thanks to you. Tell me about that. <laughs> um, Kirk, we've been talking for you know the last couple of years, you and I, about an opportunity to maybe redefine the word jazz or, or maybe even replace it. You know, What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I would never do that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so really, um, to go and see one of your bands, uh, Caleb, is to, is to get the, the vision or sort of to imagine what is going to happen, what is bound to happen in the next uh, dispensation of the music we love so much. It's a trajectory. It's, it's a continuum. It's not, it's not something completely different. But... What you've done, man, is really, uh, I think, in, informative uh, of, of where the river is flowing. Oh, well, thank you. And, uh, and it really has to do with embracing uh, the, the natural progression of this music that started in slave fields and now uh, has just, you know, with this new the era, the epoch that we're in with the technology and the sort of unleashed and now embracing and, and taking its, its influence and, and inspiration and even a lot of the elements from world music. And the, not the least of which would be hip hop, which if you ask some people, they'll tell you, well, yeah, hip hop is just the, is today's uh, black street culture. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, Dizzy and Bird and those cats, that was the black street culture of the 40s and the 50s. So, so what that did was it coagulated and involved and, and invited a whole lot of different people of all colors. But at the end of the day, the beats, the groove, the swing came from that black street culture. And so now our challenge is to go with the flow and allow the kids, which again is something I respect you for doing, allow the kids to say, well, this is the beat that I love. This is the sound that we love right now. You say, well, how can we teach you how to do that with excellence? To improvise and interact with each other with sensitivity to listening to the voices from the past and the influences of everything back to ragtime and beyond. But doing it in such a way where it's elegant. It's got the, it's got the heart and soul of this music we love that we call jazz. What are we going to call it? Well, we can call it jazz, we can call it whatever. That's not really as important, is it? It's more important, the kids are more important than sort of preserving. I've heard someone recently say, to keep jazz alive, that really scares me to death because I don't think you should keep something alive. Putting something on life support is yeah. maybe not <laughs> that doesn't sound what we want to spend too sexy. Time. Yeah. <laughs> let's say, let's follow where it's going. It's going to be alive. The question is, are you going to? Are you going to embrace it and uh, help or, uh, help nurture it in such a way that that man making sure it's a part of that continuum? You know, you said something just a minute minute ago that this is music that originated, you know, in the slave fields. Yeah. And uh, does you know you know white? There's so many musicians here, you know, involved in the jazz education network that are that are young white musicians. You know, for example, the band that I work with high school age musicians, junior high musicians. I'm in Utah. Yeah. There, there, there aren't a lot of African Americans, even yeah. in the state. Yeah. Um, how does race play into to this music? Um, you know, how do, how do we continue to make sure that, uh, you know, that, that first of all, it's diverse to and, and accessible to, to different races? And, and, and then also, um, how do we be respectful of, of the role that race plays in all of it? That's such a great question. Of course, we could talk for hours about that. But in about 30 seconds, let's say <laughs> that we begin by saying that right from the beginning, this music and the purveyors of this music invited everybody in. I think the spirit, the soul that we got from Africa, the soul of Africa was in that invitation. Mm. They said, come on, man, everybody's welcome. It's like gumbo. Then we come to the present and we say that Really, race is a social construct. It's not nearly as clearly defined as one would think. 
So you could be in a setting, for instance, in one of your concerts with your kids, where everybody you see happens to be white, but it's not what you think, right? Because what's underneath there, what undergirds their participation is an authentic and altruistic respect for, and knowledge of, I think that's important, someone has to tell you, a respect for the beginnings of this music and the folks, the ground, the fertile ground that it, that, that it grew up in. And again, that's black culture. Mm -hmm. And to say, hey man, this is it. I mean, if you don't know that, you need to listen back to this, this, and this. And a lot of these young kids, especially in your groups, they need to school some people about that. And so in that sense, your kids are kind of not white. Um, I'd hate to surprise their parents on that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but that's only because, we, again, in this, con in this conversation, we're not talking about you know, you know, e ethnicity. We're talking about a certain sociocultural awareness. You know, it's about being woke or not woke, as the kids mm -hmm. would say. Yeah. And so, yeah, you can do that music without appropriating it in a, in a malevolent way. And you can represent um, Satchmo in your music. And he would shed a tear. He goes, man, I love you for doing that. Mm. That's fantastic. But, you know, taking it down to, you know, maybe a, a, a different level, um, you know, I, I get a lot of correspondence from from educators at the secondary school level um, that say, you know, I've heard your band and, and uh, it's very exciting and, and you're playing music that, that's not available. Um, what are some steps that, uh, you know, a, a, a band director in a school could take to be able to allow for some, some creativity and forward motion in jazz when they, they feel like they're somewhat limited in the literature that's available? Yeah. How can they continue to open those doors so that, you know, that, that stream can continue to move? Sure. I'm going to answer that question right after I mention this because of something else you said. And that's that, you know, I, I think it's incumbent upon us, the adults, to, to, to be proactive um, in, in, in efforts to make sure that we've, I'm going to use a word that will make a few people uncomfortable. And that is the word reparations, mm -hmm. okay? Because basically, when we look back and we say, oh, wait a minute, that neighborhood is black and it ends up being a poor neighborhood in the ghetto because there was this thing called redlining where the government actually uh, got behind this, these efforts to make sure that certain people couldn't live in certain neighborhoods. No matter if you were a doctor or you had the funds to do it, they said, no, you can't live here because of the color of your skin. And so there are things like that that perpetrate it and continue to sort of dig the hole deeper that created what we mm. now have. It's like, wow, well, we don't see any black kids in this area. Oh, no wonder. Okay, so again, so then we in the area of reparations, we say that's not right, that's not just. So it's up to us to say, well, how can we go back and now creatively prepare a, a entree for those kids to be a part of these programs. I don't know, North Texas, uh, Berkeley, wherever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. What can I do, and Berkeley, by the way, has done an excellent job of this, to go into those communities and say, here's a ramp into this world. Fantastic. You know, you have scholars. So and increase the accessibility. Accessibility, mm -hmm. and not just accessibility, but helping to prepare them. Mm -hmm. It's one thing you say, oh, well, the door is open. Right. But they don't, they, because of this, the, the legacy of those, those denials of access, now we got to go back and, and help them be prepared to come to the door. That starts long before the application process. Absolutely, and Jen has done an excellent job of that, and I know there's a lot of things in, in, in the, in the uh, works for that. But now, as far as, like, having, you know, a desire to open up your program creatively in terms of, in terms of the aesthetic um, for newer music, uh, more creative kind of connecting with the, what's relevant now. Mm -hmm. One thing you could do is just ask your kids, get 10 of them in a the room and say, write down your favorite song. Okay, um, let's pick the two songs, that's, let's pick the two songs out of those 10 that might be cool for us to perform. Then let's just get a really good arranger, someone who actually has a finger on the pulse of actually how that music is made. Don't, mm -hmm. don't, don't mess it up, as Marcus Willis said. Right. Don't, don't make it, what did he call it, uh, a trite, um, yeah, don't make it 
you know, jive. Right. <laughs> you know, like, oh, wow, that's the corny. He said, yeah. don't make it corny. All right, and there's things you can do co to keep that from happening, and that's to get the folks who are making that music to come and consult you. You know, wow, you know, some of those people are black. Wow, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> get them to come consult you. Get an arrangement or two done on those songs that the kids like playing. Make pay, put a little solely in, solely in it or something that mm -hmm. would make your jazz people happy. But at the end of the day, you're creating great musicians who know how to improvise, who know how to listen to each other. But man, you know, they're playing music they love to play. You know what I love about that idea is you are involving the students in the creative process. And, and not only do they have the educational opportunity to go through that exercise, but at the end of the day, they have something else that's absolutely maybe more important than anything else we've talked about, which is they have ownership. Ownership. You know? And ownership and they have the mandate the additional mandate, beside the one you already give them, you better practice, you better know how to sight read, blah, blah, blah. Now they have the mandate of this arrangement, like this, the performance of this music that you say is really cool, it better be good. <laughs> that's absolutely true. Let's, <laughs> let's hope that that's the case. It does. Well, Kurt, it's been fantastic talking to you. Thank you so much for sharing these ideas. I, I know we had to get a lot of thoughts into a very <laughs> short period of time, but sure appreciate it. So once again, Kirk Whalem, and my name is Caleb Chapman with Beyond the Notes.